Welcome to another episode of The The Epic Epic Family Road Road Trip. It is now February, and winter has settled in at the island. The lake has completely frozen over, and a deep blanket of snow lies over the land and on the limbs of the forest. We have made it through the freeze-up period, which lasted longer than normal this year, as Old Man Winter seemed reluctant to arrive. After chasing summer for the last six winters, we wanted to do something different this year. We wanted to see if we were capable of spending the cold months off the grid and independent of the comforts of modern civilization. What would we learn about ourselves, both individually and as a family? What skills would we develop out here on the island? And would we be able to meet the challenges that we would undoubtedly face? After the first few months of winter, we invite you into our cozy cabin and a glimpse at our life off the grid at the island.
тоже. In 2017, after returning from New Zealand, we decided to build onto our existing cabin. Up until now, our little 25 by 20 log structure was just the right size for our family. We would visit on weekends and occasionally for a week vacation from time to time. But now we are planning to spend more time at the island between overland adventures. And in order to accommodate that, more room and functionality would be needed. Just got to get rid of this uh, deck, dig down a bit of the dirt, and then it's time to start installing the screws. And that becomes the foundation for the new floor. We got to truck in some more wood today too. Nobody said it was going to be easy. Next, we have to excavate the sloping ground behind the cabin in order to prepare for the addition. What are you working on there, boys? Digging out the area where our house, where the cabin will go. Grounds. Because we're on an island, all materials have to be brought across the lake by barge. We hired a team of skilled carpenters to help with the construction. And then uh, with the bunk bed under it, so then if anyone else is here, yes, they could sleep on the bunk bed. Now that the addition was complete, our little cabin was ready to be our summer home base between overland expeditions. During the summer months, island living is easy and pleasant, and provided the perfect opportunity to ease into an off-grid lifestyle. but we are ready to challenge ourselves once again. Would we be able to survive on the island during the freeze up without being able to go shopping for supplies? I think they like this area next year for sure. I'll plant a lot more. Could we make adequate preparations like having enough food and storage, enough firewood and propane to keep us warm, unlimited purified water to drink, and a reliable source of electricity so that we could continue to work while off the grid? The only way to find out the answers to these questions was to try. And so we got right to work. Soon the snows of winter set in, and the lake froze over. And on this coldest day of the year, as the mercury dips to negative 30, we are enjoying a cup of coffee in the warmth and comfort of our little cabin in the woods. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our cozy little cabin. Um, a lot of you have had questions over the last uh, little while about life here at the island, and so we wanted to take this week's video and try to answer all those questions and, and give you as much information as we can about what we've learned, the mistakes we made, the things we did right for living way off the grid in the winter. So. Um, there's five things that we had in mind when we were preparing for this. Shelter was obviously very important. We'll talk about each of these things. Food, um, especially when it came to surviving the ice in period, which was a variable amount of time. We didn't know. We've heard from locals it might be three to four weeks. This year it was actually five weeks. But So food, shelter, heat, and warmth. Um, how are we going to keep warm when it gets to minus 35? Yesterday in the wind, 
wind chill was minus 45, so very, very cold temperatures. How are we going to keep warm? We'll talk about that. Uh, water. Water is important for life, um, not only for drinking water or making a co cup of coffee or, um, you know, food preparation, but also it's important for washing dishes, taking showers and all that hygiene. So we'll talk about how we handle water here. And then there's the issue of transportation on and off the island we'll talk about. And then general safety, um, things that we prepared to make sure that we're safe out here because it it's no joke I mean you can get yourself into trouble in the wilderness and there's nobody coming to get you at least for a long period of time so there's some things you need to do and and uh, equipment you need to have to mitigate that risk and to be prepared so let's get right into it so the first thing to consider is shelter and we just showed you how in 2017 we built an addition onto the cabin Prior to that, it was just the, the original old log cabin, and we basically used it. We had sleeping quarters in the corner. We ate our meals in the middle. We had our kitchen over there, so everything was done in one room. But as soon as we put on the addition, that all of a sudden gave us uh, a lot more room to stretch out. And the kids were growing, so they needed much bigger sleeping quarters. So the addition really allowed us to do that. So let's take a quick walk through the cabin. And uh, the first room we'll go to is the boys' room. And so they have uh, a bunk bed in there to save space. And it also doubles as uh, Daniel's office and studio for editing pictures and, and other content creation. Then we'll take a look at Caroline's room, which is uh, very cozy and she's got it decorated just the way she likes it. Um, especially, uh, we put in a round window there, which um, kind of gives that almost like a sailboat feel, but it also is reminiscent of the Hobbit movies and uh, that whole, you know, when we were in New Zealand, we got to go to Hobbiton and that whole experience, it just makes it very, very cozy. Next, we'll take a look at mine and Carol's room. It's very simple. We just have room for a double bed in there, and then we have our clothing storage underneath the bed. So uh, someday, when it's just me and Carol, we're, we're gonna have plenty of space and we can put build a closet and things like that, but for now, it works great. On the other side is our main office studio combination. We've got these black sound resistant curtains and which allow, you know, someone can work late into the night and um, it dampens the sound coming out of there, but also uh, blocks almost all of the light. So it's a great studio to work and create content, which is what we do for a living. And then we've got uh, a bathroom in house, which has a complete shower, toilet and sink. And, uh, we also have an outhouse as a backup which uh, prior to 2017, that was our main bathroom. We'd walk outside and go to the outhouse, but now we have the luxury of an indoor bathroom. And that has been functioning great throughout the winter as well. Next is uh, our small pantry area, which also has our propane fridge freezer combination. And that's where we store food that we need to access on a daily basis. We also have jars of dried uh, food that we need to access for baking and cooking and so on. Here in the main part of the cabin we have our sitting area which is where I'm sitting right now and uh, we spend a lot of fun evenings together as a family here. 
we can sit here and read or play a board game or watch uh, a movie together. This year we upgraded our TV screen and sound system mainly because it allows us to watch our videos the way our audience is watching them. Um, when we're on the road we're doing everything from a laptop so we do the best we can but here we have the luxury of seeing what it looks like on a 4K TV with an amazing sound system and allows us to put out some really high quality videos. In the center of the main cabin here is our dining table and that's where we enjoy meals together. Um, in the corner is the heating and I'm going to be talking about heating in a minute. There's the wood stove in one corner and then our kitchen in the other side. There's a baking table and the old original um, propane stove oven combination and uh, it's a good 50 years old but still working great and uh, it just adds to that cozy um, old-fashioned you know charm that this cabinet uh, gives us when we're here. So the only other thing I'd say about shelter is when we were building it, we built it with winter in mind. We didn't know if and when we'd ever spend a winter up here, but it was a dream we had. And so we made sure that everything was well, well insulated. So the new part of the addition is like two by 12 on the floor and fully insulated and two by eight walls fully insulated. But also on the old part of the cabin, we put a new roof up there. We put a steel roof across everything. And before putting the roof on, we put a layer of insulation up there as well. So, the, and then the, the logs, the original logs are incredibly well insulated. It's, um, it's that much wood and it just keeps the cold out. We didn't know what to expect, but so far we've been incredibly warm and cozy in here. And then lastly, we have the original windows and they're just single pane glass. So they're not that well insulated, but um, it does the job for us. We may at some point go with much more efficient windows, but I don't, I, we don't want to lose that, uh, antique look of the windows and they've been doing the job for us. So I don't think it's a, it's a big worry. So that takes care of shelter. So now we know we have a good, comfortable place. The next thing to consider when, you know, living like this would be heat, especially in the winter warmth. Um, that's something that's, needed for sustaining life and so what we had to do is when all summer and mostly in the fall as well we began preparing for the winter in terms of getting firewood so we have lots of softwood here on the island um, and we spent a lot of time splitting that up and what we didn't have was hardwood now since we've been living up here we have found some good sources of hardwood for next year but what we we did this year was had uh, hardwood delivered to the mainland and then we barged it across here to the island. So now we have a really good supply of hardwood on hand and we're into February now and we've still got lots of wood. So we think we brought the right amount and we had about 12 cords of wood and we probably used five, five and a half. So we think we're gonna be fine in terms of hardwood. So we calculated correctly there. Um, we have lots of pine. We only use the pine really to heat things up, um, get a fire going in the morning if it's gone, if it went out during the night and things like that. But um, it makes a great supplement and then the hardwood burns for a long period of time. So, you know, it usually lasts throughout the entire night. The other thing about heat and warmth here is we had three propane heaters installed. One big one in the main cabin and then one in each of the bedrooms. And those, we've hardly had to use them this year. The last couple of days being so cold they've been on. But um, those are great as a supplemental heat source. And for that, we brought in a lot of propane. We use propane for backup heat. It also runs our fridge freezer combination and it runs our stove and oven for cooking. And then we also have some backup lighting, which is propane based. So we brought in about eight uh, 100 gallon propane tanks and we've used four of them so far. So in the summer, we only use about one propane tank a month and in the winter we're using two to three depending on how cold it is. The next consideration for living 
remotely like this, especially on an island where you have to wait for freeze up is the is the consideration of having enough food in store. So what we did to prepare for that is we bought a 12 volt freezer, which is an incredible freezer. It's been amazing. It runs off of you could run it off of a, a slow crank uh, battery and uh, and a small solar panel, but uh, we have it hooked into our Battleborn system, which we'll talk about a little in a little bit. So that freezer was uh, allowed us to bring in a whole bunch of meat and veg. So we have uh, these grass-fed organic beef and uh, chicken and all kinds of meat. And then we also have frozen vegetables in there. So we brought that in in November and we're, we've used maybe just over half. So we prepared properly for that. So we tend to in terms of preparation, figure out what you think you're going to need and then almost double it. That way you're safe. So we brought in lots of food. We also had a garden this year and we got whatever veg we could out of that. Um, we put away also emer an emergency food supply just in case we couldn't get off the island or couldn't get food to the island. Um, we have freeze dried meals put away in, um, in storage as well as a huge supply of things like, you know, the essentials like rice and beans and wheat berries and flour and spices and salt and pepper and all that stuff. So we haven't had to dip into that, but it gives us a peace of mind knowing that it's in storage and there in case we need it. So now we've talked about shelter, warmth and food. Let's talk about water. So we brought in a water tank. We know that we have a, a, a massive supply of water all around us. We're on an island, so it's a huge lake of very clean, fresh water. But we knew it would be a little trickier to get in the winter, so our normal water system is shut down for the winter. And we decided this year to bring up buckets of water from the lake. But we also pump it up to a tank in the new uh, shop that we built and so we can get it from either source if it's really cold we tend to go into the shop and get it there then we can stand there in some warmth and uh, if we feel like it we break a hole in the ice and grab our buckets that way but let's go over and uh, take a look at how we use the water and how it it functions for washing dishes and taking showers this is our heat water heating unit now there's a couple of ways to do water when you're off the grid especially like this um, we are looking at a permanent solution which will heat the water cables going in or the water pipe going into the lake and that way you know that it shouldn't freeze over the winter but that's something for next year and there's some things we really got to think through on that one because we aren't necessarily going to be here all winter every winter so we also want a system that we can activate when we get here and then quite easily just shut down midwinter if we're going on a trip so there's a lot to be thought about there because um, typically we close down in the fall. We run uh, RV antifreeze through the system and then in the spring when we get back, it's good to go. But that's uh, that would be a lot harder to do. Say we were leaving now and it's very, very cold outside. Trying to shut down a water system would be difficult. So for now, the system we have works and it might just continue to be the system that we use. And we're, right now what we're using are these uh, base camp uh, boss systems by uh, Mr. Heater and they're really really convenient so it runs off propane so last time I showed you we were using those little green propane cylinders but uh, since then we've moved to an adapter cable and to we use a three pounder off of the back of uh, Vandy for propane you can run that to a full-size propane if you want so since we put that on we've, we haven't had to change any uh, change up the propane and it just works for weeks uh, on end. We get our water from the lake, uh, we draw it by hand, we do pump it up to a tank in the shop there, so we do a combination of just you know drilling a hole, dipping our buckets in and bringing them up, and coming from the, uh, the shop. But in any case we bring five gallon pails into the house, sometimes they're very very cold, sometimes they have ice in them. So the way we heat them up is using this unit, um, we preheat the water, so we have the pump in there and we just circulate it through. And you can see as it goes uh, what temperature you're at. When you get it up to about 20 degrees Celsius, then you know you can have hot water for doing dishes. We use the exact same unit for taking a shower and the same principle applies. So 
Uh, let me demonstrate how we do that. Let me talk a little bit about the functionality here. One, you can turn the heat, uh, the temperature of the water up or down. You've got two functions. One is a side tap, which uh, I'll demonstrate in a minute. And the other one is the main tap, which we use as a shower head or as a, a tap for doing dishes. And you can just cycle between those with the buttons here. Th these units have onboard batteries, so they're rechargeable. So it'll run for quite some time, not even plugged into electricity. But they also have an AC and a DC adapter, so you can plug them into your system. Or if you're running this in your vehicle, you can put it into a 12-volt system. So you just go ahead and turn on the power, and then you turn on the pump. Now, the way I've got it here is set for washing dishes. So we'll pan over to that tap there. And now you've got hot water on a spray nozzle, which we just screwed to the wall there, and you can take it off, uh, move it around by hand if you want, but it's a very handy nozzle. And as you can see, that's the same unit you would use for a shower. Now, as soon as I turned on the water, the heater kicked on, and so you can feel, you, you don't want this right beside a wall because it obviously produces a lot of heat when it's heating up the water. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. And then with the, the next button, I can turn on the side tap, which is this. Now this is great for just heating up or putting some hot water into a kettle or a cup uh, for tea or whatever you want. But the way we mostly use it is when we get a, a bucket of water out of the lake and it's very cold, if not full of you know chunks of ice and everything, we'll put the pump in the pail and circulate the water through the heater. And so it's just going right back into the bucket but it's heating up that water to a certain temperature that we can now use for showers and dishes. So I'm going to switch to tap, turn on the pump, and there we have it. So this water is circulating through the pump and it's coming out a lot warmer than it is in the pail. But, you know, after a few minutes, the bucket's now got a bucket full of warm water. Any ice that was in it from the lake is melted. And then we can just go ahead and switch it back and start washing dishes so you know after two months or three months i guess of using this system um we would highly recommend it we think it's uh definitely handling the job for us you get some really nice hot showers with it we've never had a problem so um we're, we're quite happy with the system and because uh, like i was saying earlier if we had to pack up and leave right now we don't have to worry about internal plumbing in the walls we don't have to worry about if this cabin gets you know minus 20 when we're gone and there's no fire in the in the wood stove we're not going to burst our water pipes or anything we just drain this out we empty the buckets and we're good to go so yeah that's the kitchen area um, and then of course our water just drains into our septic system and i'll quickly talk about the septic system but we have a in the backyard that we've had a septic that was already in there from the previous owners which functioned great we extended it a bit um, to handle sink and shower water and thankfully that produces its own heat so it keeps it from freezing in the winter so the water drains out into there filters through a lot of sand and clay before it makes it into uh, the world and it comes out I guess as clean water eventually so okay the next consideration when being on an island is transportation to and from the island and that's the area where we've learned the most. Uh, we had no idea what to expect. Um, so here's a couple of things we did in preparation for that. One, we, we bought these machines called Snow Dogs, which are considered an early ice machine. And we get a lot of questions. Why did you go with Snow Dogs instead of snowmobiles? Well, a couple of things. One, we're going to eventually get snowmobiles as well. Um, but each one has a different function. So the Snow Dogs are much lighter and they allowed us to get on the ice a lot earlier so we're now able to get snowmobiles on the lake but we've been on the ice for at least almost a month um, ahead of when snowmobiles dare to venture out here so that gave us that early ice transportation they're also excellent for bushwhacking so we're not on a, a groomed snowmobile trail we are in the wild here so there's times we're just going through the forest and because they're narrow and the way they're designed you can kind of get through the forest quite easily with them they're great for hauling we have two trailers behind each one and we haul our groceries across the lake and so on so we think we'll always have the snow dogs but we're also going to get snowmobiles and here's why what we've learned is that the ice is ever-changing um, 
we kind of thought in our mind, you know, it's going to freeze up and then we'll have ice for the whole winter and we'll be good to go. But what we found is that you never know what you're going to, ex what to expect when you get out on the ice. So we could go to go shopping and it could be a 10 minute run on good conditions, or it could take a lot longer than that on bad conditions. And some of the things we've discovered is, um, will get a heavy snowfall overnight and what that does is push the entire lake ice down and that water has to go somewhere so it comes up through cracks and so on and it floods under the snow and turns everything into slush. Now you have a very difficult uh, way of getting out there. Um, we've had the snow dogs dig into that slush and then we can't move. Um, it takes a lot of effort to get back up onto the surface. So with snowmobiles, they have so much power, they can just blast through that. Um, so that's one reason why eventually we'll have uh, snowmobiles here. Uh, the other thing you can wake up in the snow, you had a very cold drifting snow. So now you've got big snow drifts on your trail. It's obliterated the trail that you have. Um, then you could have sheer ice conditions. So the, the, the lake is always changing. So a variety of machines is going to be important. Another thing we're looking at is for especially for the freeze up period is a a fan boat of some kind um, we had a viewer send us uh, uh, some videos of what they have for sale and that might be the one we go with uh, the problem is with most of the ones we see they're only two seaters so to get five people off the island would be a lot of trips so we're looking for a solution that will work for us but the nice thing about those fan boats is they can go across open water they can go f across sheer ice they can go through deep snow and they can go through all of all of the above so um, that's a consideration something we're going to save up for for future years so the last was my brother's helicopter came to the island but there's services nearby that that service islands that you can call in a helicopter but even then the smaller helicopter it took three days before it could actually land here so the first day a big snowstorm blew in it couldn't go the next day there was the threat of freezing rain so it couldn't go and some other weather conditions so um, it's not a you know a solution like I need something immediately that it can necessarily come unless the weather's good um, for emergencies they can get a, a large helicopter can fly through almost any conditions but uh, thankfully we haven't needed that so transportation in the winter on an island is a very complex issue to think through and uh, we've learned a lot in that area and there's some some other equipment we'll need to purchase over the next couple of years okay another really important consideration when planning to live this kind of lifestyle where you're way off the grid you're far away from any kind of um, services that could you know be first responders you need to consider yourself and your family first responders so there's a couple of things we did um, to kind of take safety into consideration and to mitigate the risk of living so far off the grid and I'll go through each of these um, we're not sponsored by any of these except Global Rescue which I'm going to talk about um, which is a program we absolutely love but step one we got some communication devices these are Zolios we clip them onto our coats when we go out because we live oh, far away from any kind of cell, cell phone coverage um, a regular cell phone won't do us any good but one of these connects to satellite and there's an app on our phone and with that you can communicate pretty much just as good as if you were on cell phone coverage so awesome awesome thing we've had them now for a couple of months we would not leave the house without them there's so many times where we've been in the middle of nowhere and want to get in touch with someone and worst case scenario in case of an emergency you can hit the SOS button and get help on the way so um, definitely have some kind of a communication device for off the grid some satellite Zolio is what we use and we also have a Garmin inReach okay another consideration especially since we're on the lake was flotation suits so these are um, winter wear so we basically got some really good quality boots because you want warm feet when it's when you're on the ice a lot um, we got these really good quality snow pants and snow coats and yesterday was minus 45 in the wind chill and we could stand outside comfortably in these suits but more importantly maybe is the fact that they are uh, flotation suits so if you fall in the water accidentally and these will keep you afloat for a couple of hours so 
that's a very important consideration. Thankfully, we haven't broken through the ice this winter, but you just don't want to take that risk. Um, the other thing we carry, and I've showed these before, but uh, these are ice picks that go around your neck. And if you were to fall in, you stab these into the ice and it gives you some something to get out of the water with. Um, once you fall in, water pushes up all over the, the ice and makes it very, very slippery. So a lot of people struggle, they can't get out of the water. So flotation suits, some really good winter suits for really cold weather to keep you warm. Some kind of a satellite communication device, the ice picks, and then um, some, something for first aid. If you're your first responder, your own first responder, you got to be ready in any contingency. So we have these uh, Fieldcraft survival bags. Now we have two, three of them, a couple different ones. Uh, one's a first aid bag with all kinds of uh, regular first aid. Another one is a trauma kit with, um, and just in case, you know, there's a massive bleed. It's got tourniquets and all kinds of um, things in there to patch someone up if they were injured. Um, we also have a med bag. So these are quick grab and go bags. And just as important as having a good supply of uh, first aid equipment is having the knowledge on how to use it. So we all took, uh, have taken various first aid courses, but that's a continual learning. So first aid and CPR, you, you never really stop learning that. So I would highly recommend you have the first aid stuff, but also the training to use it. And last but not least, what gives us the peace of mind to live off the grid is knowing we have someone we can call. So we are members of Global Rescue. They also sponsor our channel because they love what we're doing and they want to make sure that you know about their service. And we want to make sure you know about their service because it is just something that gives you peace of mind. They're not travel insurance. That's different. I think they do provide travel insurance, but the main thing for them is, you know, travel insurance will cover the costs of hospitalization perhaps in a foreign country, but what the, what Global Rescue covers is they are an insurance for your life. They will come in and get you. They would fly a helicopter here to the island and pick us up if we were in some kind of an emergency. Thankfully, we've never had to use it, but it's nice to know it's there. But even if it isn't a major emergency, you can pick up the phone at any time and call them and speak to top-notch doctors. Um, it doesn't just work for here at the island. It's also for traveling anywhere in the world, and they will help you if you need to get to a hospital. They'll help get you there. They'll make sure you get to a good hospital if you're in a third world country. They have connections all over the world. So um, get an annual program for your family and it just gives you peace of mind. So Global Rescue, check them out, globalrescue.com. And that's those are the five main things for safety, which is a very important consideration. And then lastly, I want to talk about work. Um, we make our living out here as content creators. And so in order to do that off the grid, there's a couple of things we needed. One was a very powerful, robust, and reliable source of electricity. There's no wires coming here, of course. So let's go take a look at what we did for that. All right, let's talk about how we generate electricity here on the island. We are completely off the grid. Um, there's no wires whatsoever coming to this place. Uh, there's no wires. Probably to get to the nearest wired electricity grid, you'd have to drive at least uh, 45 minutes from here once you get to the road. So we are way off the grid, but we've got these Battleborn batteries here, six of them. These are the Game, Cha Game Changer 3.0s, and uh, now we've used them for, I don't know, I guess two, two and a half months. We've used them in the dead cold of winter, and uh, we can report on their functionality. So this system has been incredible for us, whereas before, we, if we wanted electricity, we had to have a generator running, a gas generator running in the background. Um, now we don't. Right now the house is fully powered. We can run multiple screens, computers, laptops, lights, the works, and it's all running off of this system. And it, as you can hear, other than right now the freezer is, uh, the little motor on the freezer's kicked in, uh, but that's just temporary. Other than that, there's no sound whatsoever. So it's been uh, amazing for us. Got rid of the sound of a generator in the background. And so every once in a while, we've, we have to run the generator to charge up the batteries. We, we're all set up for uh, solar, except we don't have the panels yet. And that's something we're planning on bringing in. Uh, we don't know how much sun we're going to be able to get. We're going to have to really work on it here. We've got such a heavily treed island here. 
um, but we are have been spending time just trying to find where would be the best place if it's on our roof we might have to lose a few trees around the house anyway um, in order to get more sunlight for our gardens and also for solar so we have been uh, spending the time to determine where the best place to put the solar is um, so that's going to be a big thing and we'll let you know how that goes when we install it but in the meantime we run the generator every couple of days depending on how much power we're using and it'll run for five or six hours charge up the batteries and then it automatically turns off and we have unlimited uh, ongoing uninterrupted power so uh, this has been an incredible system and uh, we don't we can't say enough about it it's been a game changer for us that's for sure now that we have a good reliable source of electricity we also need to be connected to the internet um, and in the past we've had satellite internet here, but thankfully this year uh, the, the Starlink system became available in our area. So that's what we have. We installed the Starlink on a tower here, which gets it past the trees. So we get a nice direct connection and that's been a game changer for us. We have such good internet that we now can upload videos in 4K, which has been, I think uh, you get to enjoy a higher quality video on YouTube but it also allows us to do um, live calls with, with clients and with whoever we want. So communications has, has greatly improved. So this has been quite a journey for us over the past couple of years, learning how to live off the grid. That was our first uh, foray into this whole lifestyle of being more self-reliant. And we've had a lot of fun doing it. Now, taking on the winter, we feel a lot more confident that we can for sure survive up here in the winter. And so now I think over the next couple of years, we wanna move kind of to phase two of our journey to self-reliance, which would include some things like expanding our gardens to the point where we could put away enough vegetables um, in, in terms of canning and all other food preparations for, for an entire winter for our family. We want to learn how to fish a lot better. We're pretty good, we can catch fish, but it, we, if we had to survive on it, I don't think we'd be, uh, we'd be awful hungry. So we want to really learn the art and skill of fishing and then preservation of fish and cooking of, of the wild fish and so on. Um, we want to learn more about foraging. There's so much in the forest around us. We, we're really good at getting blueberries and some of the easier ones and preserving them, but there's a lot more in, to learn about wild native plants here in this area and how they provide food and um, also medicinal value. So there's a, an entire learning curve around that, which we're really excited about learning. And then finally, harvesting wildlife for protein um, rather than having to go shop for meat uh, we want to learn a lot more about how to hunt and gather so there is a lot of learning ahead in, in what we would call phase two of our self-reliant journey but we're excited about it and we're excited about taking you with us on that journey we also have a lot of overland adventures that we're planning so we're, we're combining the two lifestyles, which are really very similar. It's off-grid living, whether we're on the, on the trail, in our vehicles, or living here at the island. So stay tuned for a lot of exciting adventures ahead. That is a kind of an overview of how we live up here at the island. In terms of daily chores, um, I'll kind of end with that. We are every day bringing in hardwood and softwood into our supply so that we have um, wood to sustain us through the night. Every day, several times a day, we're bringing in water so that we can take showers, do dishes, flush the toilet, and filter it for drinking water. And then we're also shoveling snow because we've been getting uh, some really nice snowfalls, so we have to keep our porch and our walkways um, shoveled off so that we can easily get in and out of the cabin and get to our water sources and all that stuff. And then on an almost daily basis, we need to maintain our trail in and out of here so we can get off the island when we need to. And what that entails is just taking the snow dogs and running it back and forth and packing down the trail. If we left it for too long, it would drift over and we'd have, to, we'd have a difficult time getting off the island. So those are some of the daily chores of life on the island. So hope you've enjoyed this walk around. And if you have any other questions, Put them in the comments below. We'd be happy to try to answer them for you. And in the meantime, we'll, we'll see, see you down, down the road. road.
Go back to bed now, man.